Thank you so much for joining me again on the Sutherland Report as I continue my series of now, now interviewing parliamentary candidates, not prospective, but parliamentary candidates for Reform UK. One of the privileges of when we engage in the media is that we then find out how much um, the media wish to come against us with all the all the ammunition that they have. But the important thing is, is to be able to then have a platform in which we can actually come forward and explain the facts. And many and very often people don't want to hear those facts. So I'm delighted to bring on the parliamentary candidate for Reform UK, Jack Aaron, for Wellen, Wellen and Hatfield. Jack, Thank you so much for joining me, sir. It's, it's, uh, it's lovely to meet you via the digital medium. Thank you very much, Mark. It's a delight to be here. Great. Brilliant. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to find our map and then you can do, we'll do the geography lesson. Um, first of all, let's go to the UK map, he says. I'm just trying mm -hmm. to find that. And it's just the, the joy. No, I think I'll start with this constituency map. So here we are. So this is your this is the constituency, which is that yep. uh, we would say is what the we can see that it's the right hand rump of uh, of our uh, of our nation. So mm -hmm. how how far away are you from London where you are? Not far. Actually, I, I quite frequently um, get to London. I, um, I yeah, I, I grew up in London, actually. So for me, it's basically a 20 minute drive to get to my parents in north london um i, I when i go into work yeah you know, it, it takes me about well half an hour to walk to the station and within another hour i'm i'm at work so, so yeah half. jack could you describe what you do for a living and then we're mm -hmm. we're moving to uh we're moving to uh a bit of a flack that's been that's been going on so could you describe what you do for a living sir Sure. So I'm a business psychologist. So my specialization is in assessment. Um, so I do a lot of stuff, say, for companies in terms of assessing their capabilities. I used to do sort of long form interviews for people going for quite senior banking positions. So uh, after about the first half an hour, they usually open up. They start to tell you about themselves. I found all sorts of interesting things about them going sort of managing director positions. Um, and the idea is really to see if they've got the right um, competencies, if they've got the right strategic awareness, the ability to manage teams, um, make these sort of big decisions, but also to make sure they don't try to launder money in South America. <laughs> but that, that's the idea. Um, and I, I have been doing that for a few years now. Um, in my freelance work, which is really where things kind of blew up, I, I, I specialize in a certain approach to understanding personality type. It's, it's of a Jungian, Carl Jung um, origin, uh, but it's, it's different to the Maya Briggs, which is far more well known. It's a far more robust approach. It's got a lot more stuff in it. It goes far more into depth in understanding people. And, and I use that both, you know, just to make ends meet. Uh, just to do some extra sort of type analysis of people which I get money for, but also to look at different historical and famous figures. And I've looked at a large range of different historical figures over the years, um, which happen to have included the likes of Putin and Hitler and Assad, um, but many more besides that. Um, Einstein, Gisele uh, Bündchen, um, Philip II of Spain, um, Noam Chomsky, Boris Johnson, you know, the, the list is huge. And so that's kind of what I, I, I do. I like to understand people and I'm very interested in personality, how people differ in terms of personality and work together in teams, but then to the broader organization, organizational culture, which is also why I see a potential role in politics in terms of really bringing about a positive culture change. In the United Kingdom, to find those values which really make us, has have made us in the past great, and to restore that. I hear you. I hear you very loudly. So, Jack, what is the controversy that's just just happened? 
I think it's it. I think more important is hearing it straight from your mouth uh, instead of trying to put words in your mouth. But maybe sure. other other print organisations, media have tried to do. So, could you explain? Um, explain what's been going on. Okay, so there there are a few things. So these all came from comments which I made on Twitter. So on Twitter, I was doing analysis of different figures. Uh, I was doing analysis of Hitler, doing analysis of uh, uh, Assad and, and Putin and others. So when it came to Hitler, I was talking about his strengths and his weaknesses. We, we do this for every single person we, we type because we have to find out what are their natural strengths, what are they naturally good at, and what are they naturally bad at. And the idea is you're trying to find which of 16 types they would be which would mean they fit into a category of plenty of other people who can be very, very different to them in terms of levels of morality and number of people killed in said genocides. So I was doing, um, I was assessing his strengths, and I said that he was basically logically incoherent. If you were to read his, um, if you were to read Mein Kampf, it would be sort of a flow of consciousness. There isn't a logical structure that comes out in that text. Uh, instead, we see that natural asymmetry, where the logical structuring is actually very weak. But the very strong areas in the ability to reach out to people and connect with them directly on an emotional level. And from there, being able to, through expressing his own emotions, shaping the emotions of other people and bringing about that kind of, well, an emotional shift in people. So I was talking about, and I have to use the word, he was brilliant at inspiring people to action. Which he was. He had he had a, 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 an amazing talent for doing that, which he used to the most evil of ends, which is you know creating war which is when they didn't need to be war, killing many many people on the battlefield, and but even darker, the killing of six million Jews as well as um, Roma people, as well as the disabled and uh, and homosexuals and. And, and also just political dissidents. He, he implemented evil upon the world. But because in that particular context, I was looking at personality, I wasn't, and it was just a tweet as well. It wasn't a long essay. Uh, um, my friend actually did the essay on him, and that's on our, our blog. But because there's, I was doing that tweet in that particular context, a journalist, I think, was put up to it by, well, I can't say for certainty, but uh, I know the Conservative Party certainly haven't denied having anything to do with it. Um, the journalists, I think, looked through all of my different tweets, found something to think, oh, you know what, we could, if we could spin it in this way, that could look a certain way. And so that's what happened. The, what I would say to their credit is that when they did ask me, and I got this sort of um, WhatsApp message out of the blue, saying, oh, what do you think about these comments which we flagged? Um, do you think they're acceptable for a candidate to have these sorts of views? And so I sent a very, very long response, and I should have been working, but, you know, my reputation's on the line. I'm just, just, count, just countering every single bit, saying, you know, what that actually meant in context. And most of that, fortunately, did end up in the original Times article. Um, then the Telegraph rang me and they wanted to, or they said they want to capture my side of the story more. Okay, I did that one. Eventually, they had the Independent trying to get in touch, had the BBC, and I was like, no, I'm not talking to anyone. It, it's uh, work also wanted me to, to lie low and not contact any more journalists on this. So I haven't been talking to any more journalists on this. Um, um, it, it, it's been, it, yeah. It, it's been it's been difficult. Um, I, I'm I'm not sure about my job security at the moment. We'll, we'll need to see how things play out. We'll need to see if you know having that kind of thing in a headline whenever someone googles you, if that's going to cause some of our clients, some of whom are German, <laughs> to want to continue to do business with us. So there's something here about the. Yeah, the, 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 the media taking what, what you said, chopping it up to present a certain bit, namely the brilliant bit, uh, Jack Aaron says Hitler is brilliant, and then not taking responsibility for the perceptions that could trigger in people, which are not the perceptions that one would get if one actually were to read the comments in context. 
similar things for Bashar al-Assad, right? Uh, I said he was gentle because he is someone who has a very weak and unassertive temperament. The, the point of me actually talking about him, this is on a Reddit post, was that he's a good example of someone for whom their personality type does not match what you'd assume about them from their circumstances, which is that he is a dictator who has responsibility for the deaths of many thousands of people. Yes. Yes. But if you look at it, if you, if you if you were to read about him, you look at what journalists have said, look at him in interviews, you'd quickly realise, and anyone in the Middle East would tell you this as well, by the way, that he is a puppet, that he inherited a brutal regime started up by his father, Hafez al-Assad, who very much does fit the profile of that brutal dictator. And he had to step in because his brother was killed in, mm. in, a, in an accident. So he had to take the reins of that family. And Jack, that can I, can, sorry to interrupt, can I just sure. say something? That we're going to carry on doing this because your picture is rather blurry and all over let the place. Change, but I can... Let me change the, the camera so that people okay. can actually see me. Okay, Maybe. brilliant. Let me try okay, this. That, thank you very much. That's better. Uh, we'll come back. I'll just wait for Jack to uh, Jack to come back. Jack, thank you. Thank you. We're we're we'll live with that. We'll live with that. But thank you. You were chopping chopping and changing all over the place. But thank Sorry. you. So going so we got up to when you were your uh, giving a definite your definition of the personality type yeah. of Assad. And then you you were looking at that and of course I mean infamously he had then gone on to kill a heck of a lot of people and all the rest. So if you if you start at that point again, so in sure. regard to Assad. Well, the, the reason I was talking about him on Reddit, and it, it, this is again a personality type oriented forum, I was talking about how he serves as a good example of someone for whom their, their personality does not match with the circumstances they're in and the role which they play in our public consciousness is as a brutal dictator who is responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of people. And he is responsible, not taking that away from him. But he's also someone who, as I said in my words, gentle, intellectual even, and ineffective. And those, that, now those are the words I use, because he is someone who is very much unassertive, very much incapable of exercising his will against his father's generals. And so the background is he is someone who inherited this brutal regime. His father very much fits the profile of that brutal dictator, Hafez al-Assad. He was going to become a doctor. And he, yes. the only sort of doctor he was willing to become was an ophthalmologist, because that's the only role we don't have to deal with blood. I'm terrified of the sight of blood. So it tells you more about you know, the sort of man this is, the brutal dictator who's terrified of blood. So when his, his brother died, who was meant to inherit this, this brutal regime, it fell to Bashar. He had to step in. You, there's no getting away from that. In that culture, you have to step up to the plate. And so that's what happened. He had to become the next Syrian dictator. And he did. Now, in, in that, he is not the one pulling the strings. As I said, he's a very unassertive man. He's the sort of person who's wheeled out to talk to the journalist in this sort of very calm, very sort of intellectual sounding way put the right sort of makeup on the piece. Um, but at the end of the day, it's his generals, his father's generals, who continue to run the brutality. Now, the moral responsibility still falls to Bashar in that he allows these deaths to be carried out, these killings, these murders to be carried out in his name. But the point is, this is my introduction to the complexity of people that you can have very gentle people at the center of very brutal and violent events, still carrying a moral responsibility for it. But we should not reduce that complexity in saying that someone like Bashar al-Assad is, is temperamentally similar to someone like a Stalin or someone like a Hafez or someone like a, you know, a, any of the other sort of dictators we can talk about. It's about the same and then with you men, uh, me mentioning... Uh... Stalin, mm. you know, we've got the gulags that were set up uh, from 1917, I think, that then ending 
in the early 50s around about 1953 we yeah. think of the many many uh, thousands if not millions of russians that are then entered into that the starvation that was deliberate within uh, within russia you then we would then look at the personality of uh, pol pot for argument's sake uh, etc and then you were looking at the personality of hitler yeah. and but you're saying this person is using that for evil purposes and then sadly you you're describing an event of mur of murdering six six million jews and you are in fact your heritage is jewish yes you know so you yeah. are you are stepping back trying to understand or or come to a point of why why do people why do people think like this why do they react like this um so that is i'm just summarizing in a sense that's the discussion that you were provoking trying to have to so that we could understand why people uh, react react in in uh, in the particular way that we do i mean saddam hussein of course um uh, being another so what did jack what did this unleash in regard to um the press i mean you've talked about how that was affecting work and saying no i'm just going to lie low but how has that yeah. impacted your campaign in re in regard to uh wellin and hatfield not as far as i can see so first of all the jewish community as far as i know find it ridiculous and yeah. insulting that this is going around i did have a i did have a phone call from someone one of my supporters telling me that grant shaps had been going around with my face on his phone and telling people oh you know why'd you vote for him he's a hitler supporter something of that of, of that kind right with me on his phone i do know uh, as being what they told me as being the thing that they encountered on the doorstep so it's clear to, it sounds to me as though my political rivals are utilizing this as much as they can understandably because there are polling as constituency uh well, more of a predictor of the constituency showing that the amount of votes in support of me eclipses the gap between Grant Japs and Andrew Lewin, who's the Labour candidate. Right. Uh, so I can see why Grant Japs would want to, you know, do down my 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 my, um, my votes. The problem is, he knows me. I used to I, I used to knock for him for a little bit uh, before I decided it was intolerable and unconscionable to continue with this party. Um, he knows I'm Jewish. I've wished him Shabbat Shalom on a few occasions. I've even invited him to the synagogue on a number of occasions. So it doesn't look good optically for someone who's Jewish himself, yes. who knows that I'm Jewish, yes. to be going around telling people that I'm some sort of Hitler fan, knowing mm. that that is ridiculous. Mm. Um, I've had people email me who are left-wing in their viewpoint to tell me, you know, I wouldn't vote for you, but I can see what they're doing to you in the media, and I think it's disgraceful. And I know you are not that sort of person. If you look, read the article, it's clear that it's, but the, the, the image that's being portrayed through the use of the headlines is, is one which is, gro is, 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 is grossly irresponsible. Um, so I, I've had actually some positive feedback from that. Um, if I were to go on Weather well Hatfield Unhinged, which is a Facebook group, and I, I posted a video on there on my campaign, um, shot by one of my... Um, one of my volunteers very professionally and i'm very grateful to him for that um yeah i'm getting more likes than laughs which is interesting given that that group is one which is usually full of people who are more like to say sort of quite off color things usually from a left-wing perspective so i would say this has not dented my campaign it has instead been more worrying for my career prospects and you know I think there needs to be, you know, uh, there's going to be a time of where I'm not sure if me having these headlines out there are going to fly with being a professional in a predominantly corporate environment. And I'm going to have to get, get through that journey and think and, and really, you know, think how is that going to play out and, and, and wait and see, which is worrying. 
I mean, once this campaign is over, you know, all the focus on, you know, doing as much as you can and getting back to work, I'll have that sort of moment of truth where we'll be like, okay, do I still have a career at the end of this? I, I hear you. But going back to what you were saying when you're looking at personality types, and yeah. it's rather interesting when you've mentioned banks, and I'll just say this, it's very interesting how you can then be sort of running hsbc or have a high a high uh position of authority in, in mm. that kind of bank and then next minute like comey you're running the fbi so this is very very that is interesting to me what are people doing here why do why can people jump from this environment to another environment what are the skills so i'm just throwing that out there where mm. it is very interesting to look at these people or if you, you're studying someone like Hitler, you know, from a, a, a corporal uh, ends up on barbed wire in the First World War as this artist, how come he then ends up? And I, and I would say there is a definition of good and evil, and he is definitely in that, in that, uh, in that evil camp of that there is no doubt. And you're, you're, say, you're saying the same. But it's it's under, trying to understand people and how they get there, and look at those circumstances. Yeah. Um, Jack, let's let's look at the constituency now of Well of Wellin yeah. and Hatfield. So, why have you thrown yourself your hat in the ring, so to speak, um, to then uh, to then be the parliamentary candidate for Reform UK in Wellin and Hatfield? What was your motivation behind that? My motivation was, well, it's 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 a hard, it, it, it's a hard one to, to, to. It's a complicated story and journey for me because I, I joined the Conservatives after the Brexit vote, and I was very hopeful to see uh, the Conservatives deliver on Brexit and create a better situation as a result. Um, I was hoping to see traditional values be defended by this party as well. Instead, what I saw was a party that allowed the situation that we've, we've heard about with the Tavistock Centre, you know, allowing, you know, rushing children towards, um, you know, irreversible uh, hormone and then even surgical treatment, um, seeing the the loss of, you know, the, 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 the cack-handed the use of the Brexit vote, not coming out of the ECHR, um, dividing up, you know, the, the Great um, Great Britain from, from Ireland over the Windsor Agreement. And then I think which was the, the key changing moment for me was the lockdown. And the reason the lockdown really affected me, it, it didn't it didn't affect me in my personal life so much. I actually did quite well for my online personality stuff because people were at home more. Um, I had to delay my wedding. Um, but it's more the fact that we're meant to have these freedoms. We're meant to be able to leave our homes. We're meant to go out and, you know, uh, pay for things and, and enjoy life and be able to, you know, just have freedom of movement, freedom of association. And that was taken away from us based on fear, based on this um, often inflated statistics about deaths. And to find out, for instance, that you could catch COVID and then die in a car crash and have that list as a COVID death. Yeah. And to, to realize that these things going on, some could say, oh, that they didn't need to do it. I'm thinking, okay, it's looking quite a bit like the government purposefully uh, inflated these statistics to create fear, to create a tacit uh, consent to locking us down as a country. Um, Despite the fact that initially they wanted to do herd immunity, but it sounds to me like Boris was basically bullied into going along with the lockdown plan. And then when I read the effect about the effects of lockdown, I spent some time looking at scientific articles, right? And I saw one article, uh, a research paper, uh, saying that the IQs of babies born during the lockdown had gone down as much as 22 points. Wow. That if you were born, say, into a working class family, you don't have a garden, you just have a, an apartment, right? 
and you, your first months of life are confined to that one room with maybe uh, maybe two or perhaps even just one other person to look after you, your mother. That is your life in those crucial periods of development. That's going to have an effect. And what the government did was they followed the advice of, you know, their quangoized, you know, health uh, advisors. And, you know, SAGE was, um, what was giving it point of view. And they didn't consult experts in terms of the psychology. What is the mental health ramifications of this? What is the child development ramifications? They simply looked at it in terms of controlling the spread of this virus, not gauging the actual danger that virus uh, brought, in, in in balance with all the potential problems and harms caused by said lockdown. And that's not even to start on the vaccine, which was pretty much rushed through and delivered to people. And, you know, the UK was, I think, far better than other countries that had straight out mandates. If you look at the, the truckers in America, for example, we look what's going on in Australia. You know, we weren't the worst, but we were very much in the unforgivable territory, especially what we did to, to babies and, and and here's and here's a this here's a, another link jack because you within within your field of psychology yeah. would be immediately going well you've already said it with the, the effect on mental health but you'll be and you've alluded to boris johnson suddenly going for herd immunity and then changing his mind you're then looking at the leaders going well what is going on inside their head what is making them make these decisions? What pressures are they coming under? Mm -hmm. What is their per their personality type? Why can they not resist this? Why are certain uh, certain members of parliament being seen to be with certain figures that I think have nefarious uh, nefarious means and uh, on the world, etc., etc. Yes. Um, what what are your th is that a fair assessment of what? of how you were beginning to analyse all that. Yes, what, what are they thinking? What's going on? I know when it comes to Boris Johnson, this is someone who's very much um, driven by a desire to be liked by others. He's not the sort of person who can take a large amount of people showing their, their hatred and dislike for him. He wants deeply, deeply to be liked, to be admired by other people. He needs a positive emotional environment um one of the reasons is um his new wife is actually i think is very very good for him i think because she provides lots of positive emotionality um so this is someone who in the pursuit of what he felt would create more of a positive response than people saying look old people are dying because of your actions he took a very different route and that route was one which was authoritarian and abandoning any kind of libertarian principle he might have had um i think it's contemptible i think that's the end of the day in a situation like this it really tests who you are and what you're made of and in that situation he was saying we should do herd immunity and the next minute we're locking down we're taking away people's freedoms we're doing all the things which the more authoritarian countries would easily do but you'd expect them to do that you don't expect the United Kingdom to do that. And I think he is on record in saying that he was quite surprised how the, the citizens of the United Kingdom, uh, not all of them, mm. uh, went along with it. And mm. I suppose the, uh, and I, after the gentleman from Imperial College with his models that uh, he never seemed to get right at all, and whose name has completely gone out of my head right at this moment, and I'll try and think, um, that, you know, whether he's uh, looking at uh, whatever flu, et cetera, et cetera, but his modelling always seems to be wrong and exaggerated, and that particular individual has never been held to account over that either. But so you're looking at, you're looking at the, uh, the personality types there, Jack. So that is your motivation for stepping forward. So what in engaging with the wonderful constituents of Wellin and Hatfield what concerns are they are they bringing are they bringing to you yeah. um are they able to get an appointment to see their local gp are there 
inf other infrastructure problems that they're concerned about potholes hospitals school places what what's your comment what kind of comments the, the, are they the saying key, the key things I, I know that reform uk is seen as the immigration party right i would say that in berlin hatfield immigration is not the key issue the key issues are the cost of living and the nhs and my focus has been talking about how to lower the cost of living by raising the threshold before we pay any income tax of 20 grand that being 25 grand for families um and also talking about what we're going to do to get the nhs back in the seat uh, in terms of solving this uh, staffing crisis and training people up and bringing people from outside the nhs who used to work there but have left back into the nhs to make use of their skills in the short term while we do the training up i've been talking about um the Hertfordshire Candidates Plan, which is to build a teaching hospital in Hatfield, so right in the heart of Hertfordshire, it happens to be my constituency as well. Um, so we talked about that. Other issues, uh, more local issues, um, people are afraid that Lemon Garden City's high street is going to collapse. That, you know, shops are closing, people are fearful of something like, you know, John Lewis packing up and, and, and no longer being there. There's, there's a malaise there. there, there there's, a, there's a feeling that, you know, Welling Garden City is past its peak. Um, I moved to Welling Garden City three years ago because I could see it was a beautiful place. It's special. There are only two. I mean, I think that they're in the, in the moment that they're, they're trying to build a third garden city. But at the moment, there are two. They are beautiful things. This, this combination of a town and a country, Ebenezer Howard's um, blueprint, is something on the sea built across the rest of the country. And so one of my ideas, my, my personal, you know, my private members bill idea is to pass the Garden Cities Act. And that would um, protect the Garden City uh, template, right? But we're not be seeing too much building, right? The, the buildings of, uh, that are too high and also too densely packed together without the infrastructure to complement that and make it sustainable. That goes completely in the face of, 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 of the Garden Cities plan. So protect that garden, garden city template, but then use that as a template for rolling out building projects across the countryside in line with our desire to you know, deregulate um, the, the building on brownfield sites so that we can get more buildings put up and we can account for housing prices. Um, but th these are the things which uh, Res is asking me about. There's also talk about Hatfield. Now, there's often this idea of a sort of tale of two cities, tale of two towns, Welling Garden City, which has this absolutely beautiful aesthetic. And then there's Hatfield. Now, Hatfield's complicated. It's not just, oh, and then there's Hatfield. There's old Hatfield, which is, again, lovely, lovely aesthetic, lovely sort of vi village-like style to it, um, quite rural in, in its style, uh, older. It's quite spread out, though it's not got a distinct centre to it. You've also got um, Hatfield House, Again, it's a wonderful state of building. But then you've got Hatfield Newtown, um, particularly White Lion Square. And there you can see people have not thought properly about how to build a town, a town aesthetic. It's sort of carved out in the middle of these sort of big, big, big shops, you know, the big sort of metal, sheet metal lining the sides of it because you have to go between these are the very, very large supermarkets in order to get into the town centre. Um, they've recently done it up to have sort of a lot of an area of concrete with a nice tree and uh, a sort of like stepped, like stage thing there. It, it, it still it looks brutalist, and and the buildings around it is sort of almost looks prefabricated. It's not attractive. I remember when I first was looking around, I think, should I move to Hatfield, should I move to Welling Garden City? Immediately, I know that line, Welling Garden City is where we moved to. The people who were walking around Hatfield did not look happy to be in the area. I could see the shops closing down in the area as well. It's What people are worrying about for Welling Garden City is even more for Hatfield Newtown right now. So the key thing for me for Hatfield is revitalizing it. It's designing it with a new aesthetic, something which ties in, I would say, to old Hatfield and to even Hatfield House. So that people say, you know, this, this has a distinct look and I like the look and I want to move here for that look. Um, 
we do that in line with a new teaching hospital, such as bringing a sort of more, sort of more material um, economic contribution. Those are the, the local issues I'm complaining on. It's, it's protecting garden cities, revitalizing Hatfield, and getting that new teaching hospital put in. We, we used to have um, an A&E the teaching hospital um, from the QE2. The A&E side was sort of shut down, I think, under Labour, um, because it wasn't a Labour voting constituency. So I think that the, the health service side needs to be bolstering in Rowan Hatfield. It's sort of caught in the middle between the, the, um, Lister Hospital um, up in Stevenage, and right. without that same provision down in Rowan Hatfield. And what about, uh, do people feel that, what about crime levels? Do people feel that there's enough uh, police uh, men and women on, on the street? Is that is that a concern? In Hatfield, I've had that. Not so much in Wellingard City, not yet. You have the occasional thing close from next door about, you know, sort of shady antisocial individuals, maybe like, you know, with some pot or something like that. But we've had, I, I've heard cases of muggings in Hatfield. I had a gentleman approach me. He was a Pakistani gentleman, Pakistani Christian gentleman, telling me how, yeah, he'd been mugged in Hatfield and we need to do something about policing. I told him how a key thing for me is bringing back bobbies on the beat. People say we need more bobbies on the beat. It's not a question of more, it's that moving up from zero to one. We don't have bobbies on the beat anymore. We've gone to the sort of, you know, response swap team where the crime has already been committed and then suddenly send in the you send in the team, you need preventative policing. That's Bob. So bring back Bobby's on the beat. Uh, there's a plan to have, um, I think it's something like, uh, for every for every um, thousand people, uh, three Bobby's. That's going to keep the amount of uh, crime way down because you're not going to do something if you can see there's a policeman there who's searching out the area, making sure this sort of thing isn't going to fly. So, yeah, th th that is another issue. It's not right at the top, but it is certainly an important one, which we have a plan for. I, I hear you. Jack, I think it'd be really good at this point um, for you to inform people how they can get hold of, hold of you, how they can get in touch, yeah. and if they want to help with your campaign, how they can step forward to help you. Well, my, my email address, the, 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 the candidacy email address is wellinhatfield at reformuk.com. Um, I would be delighted for people to get in touch with me. The best way to sign up to be a volunteer, though, we have our database. So you go to the website, the Reform UK website, and you can get you click get involved and then just sign up as a volunteer on there. I'll be notified. And then I can get in touch to help you help us, essentially. Um, that's, how, that's how it works. Jack, have you got any hustings coming up um, other than no. the... No. no. No, I've been looking. Every day I'm looking for hustings. I haven't seen any hustings. Right. How? Um, um, yeah. I mean, of course you've had the press coverage for what we talked about at the beginning, at the beginning of our conversation. But why... why um, who will organise the hustings? Is the hustings you could actually organise? Um, why is that? Why is that not happening? I don't know. What I do know is that a number of my candidates, as so all my fellow candidates, have been left out of hustings while well, people have organised them. But I, I have a feeling that it's a very defensive campaign being fought by my opponents, and I, I, I get the feeling that. Because of that, it might suit them better not to have hustings. I think if you were to put Grant Chaps next, next to me, I don't think Grant Chaps would come out looking very good compared to me. Um, I, I think Andrew Lewin, his victory is basically assured um, at the moment. So again, I don't see what's in it for him to do a hustings. It, it's in it for Grant Chaps to try to do me down because... I'm, at least according to the constituency polling, I'm eclipsing the gap between him and Andy Lewin. So he could win if I were out of the picture. But, again, him appearing in the hustings next to me is not the way to actually give himself a better a better chance. I'm not sure what the Lib Dems, I'm not sure what John Monroe uh, or, or, or Green Party candidates, which are saying, saying about this, 
Um, but yeah, I'd like to see some hustings. Maybe there are hustings, I'm just missing them, and no one's telling me about them. Because I'm looking, it was every day on the news, yeah, they're hustings, what's going on? No one's reached out to me. It's a shame. Well, it's, it is a shame. It's also denying the uh, the voting vote, the constituents in, in uh, Wellin and Hatfield an opportunity to ask the candidates what they what they will do in, in regard to a variety of subjects. Now, what about the whole issue of, of net zero uh, moving further, maybe moving further out, not too far, but further out, you're then coming across farmland um what is the net zero conversation coming up at all it's not coming up much N not not I, I don't the thing is i don't think okay in my constituency we've got some, some not much we got we got villages uh but the main thing is is on hatfield and Welling garden city that's the main population zones i haven't had much from farmers what i would say to it is the end of the day i believe that if we are to treat the climate situation seriously we need to do it in a way that actually is sustainable and and to do it to have a sustainable sustainability policy is one which doesn't immediately do things that people are going to resent and then vote out at the next opportunity whatever they're suggesting needs to be a strategic multi-decade plan you're not going to be able to achieve that if you end up in a situation where we're going to have to ration their energy use and they take out their car between three and five o'clock on the wednesday you, you need to have um, <clears throat> enough energy for that and that's not going to be delivered from renewables as far as i can see and maybe the situation can change but at the moment it's based heavily on these uh, on these subsidies which are paid out of the green levies making our fuel more expensive and our absolutely. energy more expensive. absolutely and it's it's then no wonder that grant chaps and maybe the green party don't want to actually have a hustings with you because then you could uh, hold them to account on that and ask the classic question of what do trees do with CO2? They create oxygen, which means that if they didn't, then you and I wouldn't be able to have, have a conversation. Um, it's fairly, fairly basic stuff. So uh, another, just a quick thing I say for this, if we are to treat this seriously, we need to also get the rest of the world into a developed state so that the people, and this is what the research shows, people who start caring about the climate when they're in, in, in an environment of relative luxury. If you're worrying about if you're going to be eating the next day, climate's not the least of your concerns. So how can we possibly expect in China, Russia, India to get on board of any kind of international plan if they are still developing economies and they are still, you know, needing fossil fuels in order to get themselves to the point where the quality of life is at the stage where people would be open to any sort of green uh, targets. So I would say, if, instead of doing that, instead of having a prevent strategy for climate change, we need a prepare strategy. If we are to believe in these models, right, if we are to really take this seriously, we should have dams, we should have um, flood barriers, we should, we should have a species protection scheme to keep different uh, species alive as the as I said climate changes we need to have a <coughs> a resettlement scheme potentially for the worst predictions of pacific islanders if all of this is going to happen as said people are predicting we need to be taking it seriously instead we're entertaining fantasies about somehow being able to reverse it well the, that's a uh... You and I can debate that for two, three hours and go through quite a lot of uh, science that uh, the Green Party wouldn't appreciate. But I'll, uh, I'll just uh, slightly put that aside. So we talked about we talked about crime um, as as uh, concern. You talked about the state the the state of towns in regard to Hatfield. I think um, would uh, what about provision for young people where you were on about with the NHS which is getting people back in with the particular skills but also alluding to the fact of, of training training the local population in regard to those jobs but what about other opportunities for young people what about um, I'm not I'm 
I'm not sure of the education provision in Hatfield. I think traditionally there's been a college there in Hatfield. But what about being able to train young people in regard to plumbing, electrician, you know, trades, instead of then saying you need to go to university? What are your, what are your thoughts on that, the provision in that area? Well, I'm saying we have University of Hertfordshire uh, in Hatfield. And it's, as far as I know, it's a very sort of left, left wing institution. I'm not sure how welcome I'd be if I were to walk on there, or walk on campus. But yeah, I've been saying that I've had lots of young people coming up to me in the streets, you know, wanting to talk to me. I've got young people that are helping out my campaign with their parent permission, of course. Um, I'd like to see a sort of young reformers going on. And I think a key thing for us is about giving the youth in this country a sense of meaning and purpose in life. Um, not pushing this idea that everyone has to go to university. It is a very Blairite idea. It's a very elitist idea. This idea that you know you're not you, you're not a success unless you've gone to university and gotten some sort of degree. I said degree being you know it, they're not getting very far in an overly competitive world, causing you to you know get a job which doesn't reflect said degree. So as far as I see, we need to be accounting for the differences in temperament among people. Some people are academic, some people are not academic. Those who are not academic, rather than put a pressure on them to say you're only valuable through an academic lens, get them doing something practical, get them earning money, get them building up their confidence and esteem in a trade that they have a skill set for. That sounds to me a far better idea than sending too many people to university where they kick around for a couple of years, maybe go on some student protests, and then find that they don't actually have that direction in life they thought they did. So, yeah, I'm entirely in favor for more apprenticeships, making it work, not punishing um, businesses in making them do sort of, sort of apprenticeship levy actually worked against the reasons it was done in the first place. It's sort of a lot of conservative policies have backfired, unfortunately. I think we need to talk to people who run businesses to find out what would you appreciate that would cause you to actually bring in an apprentice. How can we make that worthwhile for you? Um, these are the things I think are very, very important. I hear you. And in the last few sort of few minutes, uh, Jack, yeah. do people feel that um, their council, they're actually getting value for money from their council or not? Do they feel that their council is accessible to them? Or do they feel taken for granted? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I just wonder what you thought. Okay, we, we've had a changeover. So we used to have a Conservative Council for a long time. We, uh, going back to, you know, the last week was Labour, was it was when Blair won the election. But we've had Conservatives for a long time. Recently, it has switched. It went to a Lib Dem and Labour Coalition Council. And now, even more recently, it switched to a Labour Lib Dem Coalition Council. And looking on groups like Weather well, Hat Done Hinge, you can see people posting, and they're, they're still they're seemingly just as dissatisfied now as they were with the Conservatives. Like, um, they still be, be complaining about how the car park was put up, you know, different things going on. I haven't seen any more protests. There actually was a protest while the council still conservative by the keeping the G in Welling Garden City uh, group. And uh, I actually went to, went on that protest. It was quite fun. But um, they they were basically saying you want to keep the Garden City as it is and you're building buildings which are too high and all the rest. So there is there was a there's been a palpable dissatisfaction that was there when the council was conservative. Now that it's changed over, I think they're in that sort of grace period. But I am see, seeing posts on Facebook groups which mirror what it was beforehand. So it, it's, a, it's a wait and see situation. What I would say is that we didn't, you know, make a big splash in the local elections. Understandably, we have more of a national party than we need to really work on our local game in the years to come. Um, we, we, I was able to field, we help field seven candidates across uh, Welling Hatfield. Um, we hope to field more. I've had people kind of saying, I didn't have the form candidates, so I just tore up my, my ballot. And yeah, 
just starting out, we we've really only been going for like three months when uh, the performance, maybe when the election was called. So it's quite early days in the map. But since then, we've had a flood of support because of the general election. We can use that momentum to now, now to fight the county um, elections next year, next May, and then the next round of local elections in the years following. Right. right. Um, Jack, before we conclude, is there anything, uh, anything else you would like to say? to be able to tell your constituents if you could also remind everyone where they can actually reach you again that would be great well one thing i would like to say um one thing i would like to say is in regards to Vladimir putin actually because i've had a number of uh, messages i've had, had two messages from people saying i no longer have to inform you today because i'm not to ask his comments and looking at the situation it seems much like you know, are taking out the context. Um, I was also, you know, taken out of context and I said that um, I said that the that using force in the world is a legitimate thing because we have a default in our world where dictators and conquerors would use force to take countries. The only reason that stopped was because the United States has the biggest stick. And because the United States is the hegemon We've been able to create a safe space in which there is some international law that people by and large follow except when america's looking weak and that's when you start to see the dictators going back to their country again so i was taken out of context to to think people saying that i said that putin was legitimate in his invasion of ukraine it wasn't what i was saying i was um again saying that the idea of force is a legitimate concept we have to be aware of and can't just paint Putin as an insane person, but someone who's following um, steps in line with his ideology, and he's utilizing force. He doesn't believe in that international order, which is only around because the US has a bigger stick, and because the US is looking weaker. Now he's taking the advantage. We need to put him back in his place by being willing to oppose um, the, the use of force to annex countries. The situation uh, with, with Nigel. There's one where he was saying that that we that the actions of NATO and the EU and their expansion would have provoked Putin into thinking he felt he needed to take some sort of forceful action. That doesn't morally justify what he did. And Nigel wasn't trying to morally justify or to side with Putin in any way. He's simply trying to give, similar to me in this respect, an insight into what these different world figures are like, what the psychology is, and the political reality of the situation is, so that we're in a better situation, a better position to oppose it and defend the great, the great status quo that the West has been able to create over the past century or the past couple of centuries. I mean, what you raise about uh, NATO and the expansion where it said it wouldn't but from 91 it has and when uh, and I'm not excusing it but when in Georgia I think in 2005 when you're turning around and going we're going to put Georgia on a preferred list to join NATO then that provoked that action and what happened so what I think Nigel may be alluding to as other people have alluded to it's the fact that what have we then provoked in the situation as well but we're not excusing per a certain person's actions but everything has to be understood and yes. the problem is i suppose what you're saying is when people want sound bites then they're not going to go into understanding the 2014 the mince agreement and going against that and then what happened in the ukraine in regard to a color revolution in 2014 that's a debate for another day and i would love to yeah. have that with you but um jack i just want to thank you for your time you. and um again um uh, thank you for a, a wonderful discussion people now know where they can get hold of you um i really hope that you manage to have some hustings um and i pray that they will that they will that they will happen um uh, that would be very good because people need to engage in the political process. But if uh, yes. if that is being taken away from us, then we have to understand, we have to maybe start to understand why we've got to redefine the political process. 
Yes, I mean, what I would also say is that Hustings, from what my fellow candidates have said, most of the time, half the people there are the supporters from the particular political parties. So the Lib Dems will bring all their people along, the Greens will bring their people, etc. So you basically have a situation where your audience is not just general members of the public, it's sort of already decided what I it is. So I then if I that's am. the case, if it's not broadcast anywhere else, is that are hustings really having the value there, or providing the value they're meant to provide, or is there another way of ensuring that people you know have a chance? Well, to be well that uh, absolutely, and that's why you very kindly have sat down with me and we're having this discussion. I'm just going to play us out. I do apologize, Jack, we've run out right, of time, but right. I sense that okay. you and I could talk for hours, so thank you, thank you very much for joining me. Stay there. And I'll say goodbye to you on the other side. But thank you very much, Jack. Very much indeed. Thank you for the opportunity.